Um, so we have about 30 minutes with you. Great. Before your, um, your public forum. So we'll, we'll just kind of go around and ask questions, but I just wanted to get the ball rolling at the classic icebreaker of, you know, inviting you to tell us a little bit about yourself, why Hopkinton, why now? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, I've been in public education for over 20 years. Uh, and uh, roughly divided equally between being a teacher and being a school leader, curriculum leader, and building principal. And, um, I'm in a family of educators, and that includes my wife as well, who's a third grade teacher. Um, got two great teenage boys, usually great. <laughs> um, they have their moments. Uh, we've actually had some fun these past couple of days with the snow. Um, I think uh, why Hopkinton and why now is because, I guess, in a word, um, alignment and vision. Uh, the vision that animated your strategic plan development process um, where you actually had a prompt about uh, to people about like how has the world changed and, and how are the schools responding to that change. I just thought it was so impressive. And then, and then that you created it so deliberately and thoughtfully. And that process and that way of working is really closely in line with how I've led in schools and in communities. Um, and then another sense of alignment is the imperative in the plan to have alignment among all of the schools around all of the different strategic initiatives. Um, and then you can see that in the school improvement plans that are that are already drafted. And you can see um, a clear, I mean, even just the template that the things are on are, are common. And, and that everybody has a, um, a a goal around social emotional learning and that it's slightly different from school to school um, but that there's you know common threads like uh, Michelle Mercy Winner's social thinking program, there's some regulation from Jessica Minahan, I love the FAIR plan framework, um, the uh, commitment to Fountas and Pinnell reading interventions in the, uh, both the center school in Elmwood in different ways, it makes sense. Um, there's uh, Priorities. Actually, I have to um, with the principal. Um, uh, I, I think I'm not sure. I think it was at the Hopkins School who uh, grew up uh, a little bit of time in Mercer Island, Washington. I grew up in Washington State too. Oh, so, okay. um, but I actually what I really loved on her page was this um, statement about uh, passionate learning comes from a foundation of compassion. Yeah. <laughs> <It does. laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I really so there's an align. I really believe in that. And and um, uh, the priorities in the school improvement plans in the middle school and the high school around in the middle school we're doing work on looking at student work as the anchor for you know, and and just uh, even just looking at the grants that the education foundation funded for the middle school um, around uh, this is the no red ink and there was a vocabulary building. Um, and it was so like honoring middle school kids and who they are and and you know how wonderful and you know tender they can be and and um, the high school having such a clear commitment to peer observations and feedback and learning walks and I've led around those things I have expertise to lend to them and I just I so appreciate the alignment and the way that people have linked arms in the town around these common priorities all about um, a, a 21st and even 22nd century vision for teaching and learning. Um, and I would love to be a part of that. So that's why I'm here. Can you tell us about the biggest challenge that you faced in, in, in either building-wise and buildings that you've been a leader in or district-wide mm -hmm. in the area of special education mm -hmm. and how you have worked to address the concerns and the challenges working with parents, students, and your team? Well, I'm right in the middle of it. So this is good. Great. Um, so in the two principalships that I've had, I've had a significant, substantially separate special education program or programs running in the school where I've been principal. So um, right now, uh, in Arlington, there are seven elementary schools, and each one of them is a bit of a hub for a different population of substantially separate programming. So the school where I'm principal happens to be the hub for students with uh, ASD diagnosis, uh, yeah, autism spectrum disorder, that might also need sub-separate program because you can't have that diagnosis and be in a 
be in your home school, but if you do need some separate program, you come to school. Well, you might imagine that the program's gotten big as the few years have gone on. And so uh, the strain has been, we've been, you know, I like to tell everyone we're cursed by our success. Mm -hmm. It's going so well um, that we are, grown, I mean, so from the time that I've begun, uh, we've grown 200%. Um, and there just hasn't been the correlating uh, staffing uh, resources to go along with it. So, you know, honestly, I've just gotten creative in a lot of different ways. Um, mining schedule, I mean, I don't know how granular you want to get, but, but like mining the schedule of uh, instructional support people, TAs, paraprofessionals, mining their schedules, those who aren't actually connected to the program. And say you're a one-to-one -one supporting one particular student, um, there, I know that there's times during the week that they have um, uh, service provider work, like they might be at speech or at OT or something like that. So I got something for you to do, other than running copies for your gen ed friend, which is, you know, which is fine. But uh, just really ringing out kind of every hour that we can. Um, also, I've, and this is actually a, a challenge unique to the K-1 uh, cohort, which is really big, but. Um, I happen to, and I know Dr. Kavanaugh went to Leslie, and I'm there, to, I was there, I keep saying I am there, <laughs> I was there, it's all over now. Um, and I made a lot of connections in the early childhood program, and made an intern uh, program where the students who are rising educators um, are being compensated at, you know, as you might imagine, a, a bit less than uh, what a typical TA or paraprofessional would be compensated, but they, we've got three interns now from Leslie working in the program as well. So just, you know, getting really creative with resources and bringing out everything that we can. Having said that, I am taking a meeting um, tomorrow at 1.30 with the superintendent and with the director of student services uh, just to move along what's that, because we're really just at the, the end of what my creative solutions are. So, um, so you know, again, it, it's uh, it's a nice problem to have in some ways, and oh boy, would I not trade that program for the world. It's just such a, a source of learning in lots of ways, not the least of which the expertise of the practitioners who are in the program and what they bring to, to everybody. So um, anyway, that's, that's what we've been dealing with lately. It's, it's great, thank you. Yeah. My question is related to innovation and education. What does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. And can you share some specific examples? Yeah. Um, I know that sometimes when folks hear that, they kind of instantly think of screens. And um, I'm really a believer that the screens are the reason why we need to do innovative teaching and learning. But you can't just hand a screen out or an interactive whiteboard and think that you're innovating. That's the reason why we have to innovate, is because workplaces are flat and they're um, decentered and you need to be growing in skills that are uh, not the skills that maybe all of us uh, grew in in school and so innovation in education means that you put a premium on what's mentioned in the strategic plan those four C's of, of 21st century learning of communication creativity collaboration critical thinking that that's what is put on the front burner of teaching and learning. And I notice in the school improvement plans and in progress already made that, that folks are heading in that direction. But it's, it's teaching dispositions and mindsets and attitudes and you know emotional intelligence and regulation of emotions, most notably, especially in the, in the high school, anxiety and stress. Um, that has to be the thing that we're working on and that the disciplines are, not to say secondary, but they are uh, the thing that we're going to use to teach those deeper things. So that's what I think of when I think of innovation and when I think of examples, I brought in um, this year an old friend, but he was a school designer with expeditionary learning uh, for a long time and, and you know, they're kind of who they are is kind of in their title. You know, it's this notion of project-based learning that uh, reaches out to the public and, and they, they do field work. They don't go on field trips. You know, it's really authentic stuff. And we've been working, it, I uh, brought about half the faculty. It was kind of a sign up if you want to do it. Um, I did have Stephen do a pretty good dog and pony show, so I think that folks were pretty interested. 
and they jumped in and once a month we get together and we've designed six different projects that are going on that yeah uh, bring along all of the 21st century technology but essentially what they are is students learning how to do lots of iterations of things lots of drafts lots of um, feedback being welcome to feedback I notice in the in the strategic plan and the school improvement plan for the high school that this notion of being okay with failure and, and teaching that and teaching it explicitly that's innovation in education uh, it's uh, yeah it's not a, it's not a lot of iPads uh, it's what the iPads um, allow us to do now Answer and I think I'm changing my question in response. Oh, right. yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> so I, I'll tweak my question. Um, so initially, I was going to ask about curriculum, which I still am going to ask about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your role as assistant superintendent here in Huntington would largely involve curriculum mm -hmm. leadership. Um, but at hearing you talk about your substantially separate groups of students, mm -hmm. um, is there anything in the curriculum? I guess maybe two-part question. Could you speak to what you, you how you envision that? Mm -hmm. But maybe in your experiences now, how do um, or do the students who are substantially separate are they able to be integrated integrated into the general curriculum mm -hmm. into the general ed classrooms? You know, are there what ways do you make that happen? I guess. All right. Well, let me let you up with the first question you're supposed to ask about curriculum leadership <laughs> generally. <laughs> Thank I you. Always, you know, <laughs> oftentimes and sometimes the the title of the assistant superintendent is for curriculum and instruction and. Right. Um, I really uh, the first thing I think is really important is never to decouple those things never to be thinking of curriculum as a binder that um, is the is the thing um, if it's not if we aren't always thinking about uh, what the teacher moves are what are those really subtle gestures and an environment creation that, that teachers do to make the curriculum live then it, then it does just, in my experience, it does just become the thing that we have to cover. And you hear a lot of that, oh, I've got to cover this, I've got to cover that. It's like, well, if you're the one covering, you know, what are the kids doing? So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, hard, it's hard with the just frantic pace of a school year for people to think otherwise. But I guess that I would want to learn with people about how to, um, make curriculum a living thing that more people are excited about and have their hands on and I guess development change alteration of the of the learning goals and and how we get there that has to be in cooperation with faculty it has to be with teachers um, both as a teacher and unfortunately I have to confess as a curriculum leader I've been a part of handing the binder or having the binder handed to me and it just can't go like that um, it's deadly um, but around inclusion you know, we really pride ourselves on for the 29 students in the program at being really individualized. Uh, there, and we always err on the side of a least restrictive environment. So we have uh, what we ended up with is is a culture and a, and a school community that, frankly, has a lot of kids pretty tolerant of some pretty unique presenting behaviors in classrooms. And I think that's a pretty great opportunity for all involved. Um, and, you know, I mean, you, you always are asking a question, what's the best for kids? So um, if kids have unique impulse control challenges, that then, you know, they're not having any fun and their peers aren't having any fun, and there's a, then we might make a decision to um, pull out. But ultimately, we want to, you know, if, if, you know, different kids present in different ways, and um, if all kids can learn that, uh, then we've done a great service to all 400 plus, not just the, the, the 20 something each year. Thanks for answering my two part uh, right. semi related questions. All right. Yes, thank you. Good. Um, so I'll switch to the, the less engaging topic of budget. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you develop your building budget and just you know, projecting forward into a, a larger district budget? Sort of what are the priorities and in, in years that are lean where mm -hmm. difficult decisions need to be made or even reductions need to be made. How do you go about approaching that? Yeah, so uh, I know that in many ways we have just one cost center among nine in, in a district is different than being part of a central admin team trying to develop 
how the district budget will be deployed. But I think that one thing that I would bring along is, boy, this idea of just as we're talking about curriculum development, a budget development has to include the people that are most affected. And um, Dr. Bodhi, the, the superintendent of Arlington Schools, does a great job bringing lots of people in so that by the time that budget's drafted, no one's really surprised. Um, when there's rough news to pass along, it's passed along early, people are given time to think about it and say, okay, well then, how, you know, let's do that prioritizing conversation and let's we literally put it up on the, uh, on the sticky notes on the board. You know, this is the whole admin team. Um, and I think that I would mimic that process of involving school leaders, curriculum leaders, um, and the degree, degree possible and whenever it's appropriate, uh, faculty representatives too. And try to um, get everyone not always feeling good about the budget that they're working with, but feeling good that we got to the, the final budget in a process that was transparent, open, and collaborative. So I know Arlington is a very diverse community already. Hopkinton has been growing and our diversity mm -hmm. is, is increasing. The demographics are changing in ways that are both exciting, but also we want to make sure that we are being promoting excellence through the diversity and not just having it people feel on the side. Right. How do you think as a, an assistant superintendent you could help to promote excellence through and with the diversity? Well, I think that I remember um, one of the first courses um, on this topic, I don't know if any of you remember, Empowering Multicultural Initiatives, EMI was a framework that was used around the state quite a bit. And I remember being a part, of the, like the launch meeting uh, was folks jotting down who they are and what they're all about. And then it was sort of a categorizing exercise. And then what we realized, and it actually it happened to be a pretty homogeneous group of people at first glance from the point of view of language community, um, ethnicity, and race. And yet, when we looked at what we produced, we realized actually we're diverse by being a group of human beings that happen to be in the room together. So I think that when, when you're trying to include, whether it's special education or non-native English speakers, I think that there has to be an overall climate that is about inclusion, not we're going to include non-native English speakers or we're going to include students on ed plans. It has to be, we need to create a school community that's inclusive and we all know what that means all the time. We're uh, committed to certain ways of doing things that's open. We listen, we build in moments. I love the one thing that we do uh, at the school on principal now is we have closing circles every day in every classroom. And sometimes some hurt feelings and grievances are aired at those closing <laughs> circles. Um, all that, uh, you can build routines of not respect in just sort of a trite, you know, motto, but like real respect among all children and then from the grown-ups to the children and back so that then when you turn your attention to how do we work with students who there's like empathy and compassion like already there and and so I think that sometimes we make a mistake and I think that um, in some ways the SEI endorsement for for educators was one of the places that we might have been able to do better as a commonwealth because it was it was focused exclusively on teaching moves in the gen ed classroom around non-native English speakers it's like well if that's going to be the narrow focus, then in my experience, sometimes those don't live as deeply as a priority on creating a climate and a culture of mutual respect, support, compassion. Then you'll be able to you know, do lots of things that you never imagined because you're trying to support everybody. Um, I know that seems like a 30,000 foot um, answer and it kind of is, but um, and it would have like on the ground implications, but I really believe in that. Thank you. Um, my next question is about the risk. And I would imagine that in your role as an educator and in a leadership role, you'd have taken many risks. Mm. You 
career and some may have gone very well and I'm sure there are a few here and there which do not go mm -hmm. so well. Can you share uh, risks that you took which did not go so well and what did you learn? Oh, that's wonderful. Um, i trying to pick a good one. You know, so I, I think that actually this is a kind of a good story because because I did step in it, but then I stepped out of it. So <laughs> I like I, I like this one. <laughs> um, so in my um, most recent principalship, there was um, it was it was about speed of transition, leadership transition, and uh, it was a, a there was some context to the role that I probably should have let in my brain a little bit. But I came in, as you might imagine, enthusiastic, and um, that's all grand. But you know, folks have their rhythms and and their ways of doing things, and they often feel like they work just fine. Thank you very much. So um, there was a particular framework of responsive classroom, um, which I came as an enthusiast of. It's a, an approach to elementary education and now middle school education that, uh, in some ways, gets us to that overall environment of, of compassion that we were just talking about. Anyway, um, I really pushed that. And um, some folks were beginning to feel like I might have been a paid spokesperson for this <laughs> framework. And yeah, you know, the, the leadership team, which I was glad to say I grew when I, when I got there, uh, all gave kind of some unambiguous feedback about the, the, the speed with which we were going in this direction. Um, so I toggled back. And um, and wondered both in my own head and aloud uh, to close friends whether it was you know if that program was ever going to have a chance. But I learned a lot about going slow to go fast on that. And now looking back, uh, there's only two general educators and a handful of specialists who haven't gone through the four-day training. It's it's the thing that we do now. Um, I think that on your visit. Um, the faculty probably mentioned, you know, that framework. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, that was that was great that it that it that it landed well, um, and you know, I think that that's what you learn over time is when you are taking a risk. Because I think that my problem there is I didn't even realize I was doing so, um, but now I I'm way more reflective and and will. Know, spend a little bit again more time to make up time later for sure. Thank you for your honest response. <laughs> yeah, you bet. I got many more. <laughs> <laughs> we all do, right? Yeah, that's the way it goes. <laughs> we, we're yes, okay yes, for time? Yes. All right, I know I check it. I just want to make sure you don't miss your you know, oh, yeah. in the spotlight. Oh. I don't want to make you late. Um, so, my last question has to do with assessments and um, you know, other than the sort of big statewide mm -hmm. assessment that we all know about, um, what other types of assessments do you value mm -hmm. to measure um, student progress, student success, student growth, but also building and district-wide success and growth? Um, and then what kinds of ways have you in your role as curriculum director, principal, have you, you engaged your staff to utilize those forms of assessment? Mm -hmm. Uh, there are um, kind of two different camps of effective assessment that I'd want to talk about. The first is uh, really great screening, scientific-based, general outcome measures that can um, get at, at a pretty accurate sense of especially our earliest learners where they're at. Um, I noticed that uh, center schools using BAS, which is great. Um, I think that I've also, and actually that's going to be my tale of, of having been successful in encourage, encouraging the use of an assessment framework with the Dibbles. Um, and so uh, there are really good um, sort of quick assessments that allow you to progress monitor. There's a million different frameworks that are um, anchored to that. Uh, Ames Web, there's, there's you know, many out there to buy. There's, there's a good handful that are, that are based in good research that, that one should really consider. Um, so those are 
you know, kind of a smaller camp and a little bit of a discrete set of, of again, especially for our earliest learners. Um, and then there's, a, and I noticed that this was a priority at the, in the middle school, school improvement plan, to get students to be goal setting themselves. So assessment for learning and not just by the teacher. If the best assessments that are out there are the ones that students are a part of generating and are a part of assessing themselves honestly. And then, uh, as I said in another context a little while ago, uh, to reiterate and to do again. If assessments aren't a launching point to then do again, then they aren't getting all the power. There are summative assessments that, that are important, obviously, just given how we work as a school system, final exams, things like that. But I wonder sometimes, actually. You know, I, and, and I think that if you can get young people in the habit of self-assessing with their friends and giving peer assessment, then you're more accurately creating a habit for the 21st century workplace. Um, you know, I don't know how many of us have jobs where you, you, know, you sit down with a pen and paper at the end of a certain work time and then you're, you know, judged on that. I mean, but it sounds pretty horrible. So, um, <laughs> the, the, Stephen, who we're working with, this once a month consultant from EL, uh, he has done a great job helping us to develop rubrics with young people. We did this one in fifth grade when after the survey they said the thing that they want to work on more, the most is listening to one another. And so they developed a, um, you know, what Stephen called, what are bridges and what are barriers to, to listening to one another? And how can we create a rubric? And then we run film on different class meetings and they assess themselves on how well that they're doing. Um, that's really powerful assessing. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a balancing act, and we haven't quite solved this, and I haven't, and I'd love to learn with folks in Hockington about how to balance the grown-up in charge who's assessing progress with students self-assessing, but I feel like there's a lot of room in a community like this for students to be the ones in charge mm -hmm. of measuring their own progress and reporting out on it proudly. Um, but that leading around the Dibble's uh, implementation was really leaning on uh, experts. Um, this wasn't a, um, a binder that I showed up with. It was connecting with a reading specialist um, who it came to me with a with a case for this uh, early screening um, measure, and um, and I knew that she was respected and supported by early childhood faculty. Um, so we got together and we opened it up and we tried it in a modest way and then we tried it in a bigger way and we, you know you just kind of if something's a good idea it'll happen you just you know as a leader you, you do, try not to screw it up you know, and <laughs> get in the way of it yeah good thank you yeah. thank you i think we have a tape we could give you for your students to analyze around uh, listening to each other <laughs> I know, it's a budget meeting Oh, I can give you guys a rubric yeah, too. Okay. You can self assess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that might help. Um, so, I do want to make sure that we offer you the opportunity to ask us questions, or if there's a question that you wish that we had asked you and we didn't <laughs> that you would like to answer, um, you know, please feel free. You no, know, I was just thinking, looking at all of the work that was done in the strategic plan, and, I, and there was an element um, that before that was drafted, the um, professional learning committee. Um, and there's school committee policy around the philosophy of professional learning that I imagine probably be worked on or adjusted given the kind of the new draft of the 2014 strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I w um, we are in the fifth year, fifth year, right, of our strategic plan. So that's going to be an important focus of our work for the summer and early next year. Um, and so I think at the timing, actually, the timing of our last strategic plan coincided with Dr. McLeod entering the district, and so um, the timing, you know, with Dr. Cavanaugh starting her job, I think, is really a great opportunity for her and for the you know, assistant superintendent to really, um, to really lead that charge, take a, a hard look at where we are, and you know, I think that even in those five years, education has changed quite a bit. Um, the needs of our students have changed quite a bit. We didn't. I don't. I was on that committee, and I don't remember having a lot of conversation about social emotional learning the way we do now mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think that 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 will be an important piece of early work um, for Dr. Kavanaugh and for the new assistant superintendent. And I think it's going to be a very exciting opportunity yeah. Yeah. Um, for both. And I'm not sure that I answered your question. No, you did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, really, that was the only thing I you know for for this group. But thanks so much for your Conversation. Thank you. Why Hopkinton? Why now? And then we'll let the, the massive crowd ask you some questions. Sure. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was actually thinking a bit about that really precisely on the drive down. And I think it's, in a word, alignment and vision. Uh, the alignment part is just how impressive the alignment is around uh, the strategic plan for the district and how it fits into every one of the schools and the priorities that are articulated there, um, including a priority on having school improvement plans that are connected to the strategic plan. And then what the vision is of that plan and having such a premium on 21st century learning, the 22nd century learning in that strategic plan and then reflected in the school improvement plans and reflected in the choices that are being made in each school about teaching and learning. Uh, it's it's a really exciting community. The, the connections between um, even the Education Foundation and, and the grants that they funded and, um, and uh, the way that the PTA is working and, and that there's a coherent PTA that's linking all the schools is really impressive. Um, and it, just little things, the, you know, the template of the school improvement plans are all the same and they, they all have an emphasis on literacy learning and social emotional learning. Um, they have uh, all elements that I have a lot of uh, experience leading around and it feels like a lot of alignment for me too, a lot of connection to, to what I've found important, what I've been um, pretty successful leading around up to this point. So it feels like a, a, a really nice fit and so yeah. Can you talk about your experience that has brought you to this point in your, um, so I'm not sure if everyone's aware of what your uh, what yeah. your, how you've gotten to this point yeah. in your career and what your yeah. experience is. So uh, I've been in public education for a little over 20 years and it's been pretty equally divided between uh, being a classroom teacher and being a school leader, um, whether that's around curriculum leadership or as a school principal. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's been increasingly um, work that has focused on dispositions of students um, around uh, the stuff that you can't just point to in a curriculum map uh, and that includes the four C's that you mentioned in the strategic plan, the 21st century skills that are right there, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication. Um, and I've really led both as a, as a school leader and as a teacher around disposition focused teaching where you're really cultivating certain attitudes, certain mindsets, um, and not the least of which a, a mindset of uh, democratic citizenship. And that's not just like a you know, platitude, it's, it's really uh, preparing students to be uh, communicators in a civil society. And that I think is also aligned with what the 21st and even 22nd century workplace looks and sounds like. It's flat, it's collaborative, it's democratic, and I've really tried to emphasize that kind of, the lead, and so the leadership is also democratic and collaborative and flat, and, and that has worked. And because the grown-ups work that way, then the young people end up knowing and feeling that and, and work that way as well. Um, so it's been, you know, all the vicissitudes of 20 plus years in public education, but I feel like that's been an arc that has um, more recently really informed what, I'm, which is again why uh, the priorities of Hopkinton are so appealing. 
uh, they, there seems to be an alignment and an interest and, an, and a prioritizing of that kind of teaching and learning. So I'd, I'd love to be here and be a part of that. So I think your leadership has been at the elementary level, a lot of it. And I think, if I recall, you, you have taught um, at the middle school and high school level. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm at the middle school, and um, I know that our teachers um, at the middle school and high school level are always concerned that an assistant superintendent can be a resource for them for their, um, their curriculum, like new science standards, literacy mm -hmm. at those grade levels. Mm -hmm. And so they look at an elementary leader and think, well, what can this person do for me? So mm -hmm. what can you do for our middle school and high school teachers? Well, I think it's important to recognize that that was the first part of my career was as a secondary uh, teacher. Um, I was a French teacher, um, history as well. Um, I went down a path of, of academic philosophy that I was happily saved from by working with young people. And, um, and I feel like the rich intellectual environment that we're trying to coach our students to be at home in um, as secondary school teachers is something I'm familiar with. And I know what the unique challenges are that go along with that, not the least of which this, this framework of having um, a group of students for 50 to 60 minutes and then having a new group of students. And, and that's really challenging. And, and I do get it. And, and I also can, you know, I can go into the stratosphere too and around the content curriculum as well. Um, but I will always sort of emphasize in, um, in working with all students, K through 12, around the skill development growth, the disposition development growth, and I think that middle school teachers are so aware of that um, in all the dispositions that they face every day. Um, and actually my wife and I, she's a third grade teacher, we're just talking about our admiration for middle school <laughs> teachers. and. Um, and we have a 13 year old, so that helps. Uh, and so, we're, you know, we're just thinking, you know, the, the best ones are just so aware of how temporary some of the sillinesses are and that they just see past that and, and do great things for kids um, and try to encourage that, you know, deeper disposition. Uh, and yeah I, yeah, I feel like I, my curriculum leadership work uh, was, seven through 12, so there was a good number of years that I partnered with some just dynamite middle school educators, and um, yeah, hats off to you, yeah. Can I ask your signature question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so I have a second grader uh, who, uh, who enjoys school, loves being in class, but comes home often bored, uh, find school to be quite easy. Um, and Hopkinton does have a good uh, public school system, but I was just uh, curious to know what your thoughts would be in enhancing the curriculum for advanced learners at this early age and probably even moving forward. Because um, we have a loaded classroom of 20 plus students and a single teacher. It's not very often for that teacher to sort of take care of all levels of, uh, um, you know, uh, children in a class. Mm -hmm. So how can some kids who are slightly advanced learners mm -hmm. um, be challenged um, through curriculum right. that sort of works for them? So um, around your son in particular, um, in that second grade classroom, you know, that, that would be a, a that particular, your particular classroom would be a great thing to explore with, with that particular teacher and the principal and, and try to figure out what it is that's um, not engaging or, or too easily mastered or, or that that's a perception and, and I wouldn't want to think that anything I'm about to say is going to answer that but I can talk about differentiating for advanced learners more more generally. And I think that if, th there's sort of two paths to go, I think, in, in how people respond to this particular challenge. One is really rich programming that is able to meet students wherever they happen to be. So project-based learning that's really done well 
allows for access points for the most advanced students to go in, in just phenomenal directions. And I'm working with a, with a collaborator from who was with Expeditionary Learning for a while. And we really notice that when there's authentic, real world, project-based units that are part of the classroom, all students enter where they can and then can be, there's also space and time, you're mentioning that given the number of students. Because students are engaged in projects, you can you know, parachute in and get to students as they're working on projects and really um, push them to say maybe go interview someone else and write this even more extensive report on what real archaeologists are doing in this field. So that's one way of doing it. I think another way is to be really mindful of assessment data. And it, it's really hard to be um, differentiating for, for learners unless you've got real information in front of you. So assessment data can be lots of different things. We were just talking with the school committee about um, some very specific ones for early learners around reading and, and math skills development. But I think that the most powerful assessments that I've seen are the ones built in classrooms um, by and with students. And that's really possible for students to self-assess and to be a part of the learning conversation. We have our kindergartners doing a weekly learning plan at the end of each week so that then the next week they really know what they're going to be working on. It's brought out again. Um, this is even, you know, some pretty early writers. and. and go into how they do that but but I think that I think that one thing that actually can uh, get us away from what's best for all kids including students who are achieving at high levels is to be doing too much pulling apart of classroom communities and too much differentiating out of a common room I really think it's possible to do that within the classroom and within a dynamic group of very different learners and that all students benefit from that. And that's, that's good research-based um, uh, sort of insights that have been gained, is that all students do benefit from having uh, a rich community of lots of different kinds of learners. So I think that, it, you know, again, I'd want to hear more about your experience and hear more about, in particular, what your son's experiencing and what he perceives is going on. And, but I think that if we do really great teaching and learning, then all students really do benefit from that. Um, and I'd like to be a part of making the very best practice be a part of what's done here in Hopkinton. You're welcome. So you just talked a little bit about teaching writing to young students. Uh, what philosophies and practices do you have about writing instruction with kids who are, say, K to three? So um, I've been a school leader in um, two different schools, both of which committed to the Calkins Units of Study. And, you know, like every framework or program, it has to be a means to an end. I mean, you're not doing Calkins writing so they can be great Calkins writing students. You, know, you want to be great writers. And so what I've noticed is like lots of, um, lots of challenging programs. Um, what the Calkins success story comes from are kind of common protocols and, and routines for students around what it means to be uh, doing a mini lesson with a teacher. So uh, a teacher will do a very brief mini lesson around a very point, and, and that too has a protocol and a rhythm to it. And then students are left to independently write. And so I think this speaks to your concern about frameworks that allow for individualized instruction. Um, then the conferring dynamic between student and teacher is really protocol based. Like when the teacher plops down, you know how it's going to go. And then over the arc of the workshop, 
right in the middle of the workshop is sort of a mid-workshop check-in point that the teacher has, an even more mini, mini lesson. That you, so these are all important and interesting, but I think what's most important is that there are routines and protocols that kids can hang their hats on because writing is the most challenging from a point of view of executive functioning and stamina and, uh, and perseverance and, and also just uh, sort of higher order thinking being applied in real time. It's so challenging to do great writing. And if you have norms and routines and protocols in place, then kids don't have to be thinking about that, like what's writing today, you know? And so whatever we do, I think that it would be important to anchor to those. Uh, and then as the years go on, kids are really used to these, little, they really start to soar in their writing. Um, but it doesn't have to be Lucy's, it doesn't have to be anybody. It's just the idea that, that there's routines for kids to, to hang on to. Michael, earlier you talked about um, the school improvement plans and the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're not currently employed by in Hopkinton, but uh, what are some of the things that you feel like uh, from your areas of expertise now and what you might see in Hopkinton that you feel like you could bring to us? Yeah, so at uh, the center school, uh, there's a commitment to the BAS um, uh, progress monitoring system for early readers, and I got good experience with Fountas and Pinnell's work. And, um, and I also was wondering if there was any reading recovery work being done with the first graders there because I've done some work on that. That's an element that I didn't see in the school improvement plan that might be helpful. Um, in, and also all of the, the commitments to social emotional learning in each of the schools, whether it was Jessica Minahan or Mar uh, Garcia Winner's work, uh, those are all named in the school improvement plan and those are things that I've led around and can and can be, I think, a help. Um, and then uh, at Elmwood School, there's a, there's a commitment to LLI, which is Level Literacy Intervention, which uh, is what my current reading interventionists are using. Um, I'm familiar with that and with the foundations program. In both the schools, I, I think that I might be able to also lead around uh, phonemic awareness work. And, and making that an explicit part of early literacy instruction, not just the Wilson Foundation's work, which is the phonics. Um, I think that uh, at Hopkins, there was, um, a, a, you know, again, a, a real commitment to social emotional learning. Um, I also noticed that, that there is a, uh, a drive to, to be, you know, responding to what most, uh, sort of intermediate elementary schools are trying to work on, which is uh, where high need students on the MCAS are, are maybe not you know, getting traction as, as we would like, and, um, and I've had some success with that as well. Um, the middle school is working on looking at student work and using protocols. I, I worked with Tina Blythe out at Project Zero at Harvard, and, and actually someone else at Harvard I'm working with right now is, um, uh, Mardell, Ben, he is a director of the Pedagogy of Play project, um, and we did some work around early childhood learning that I'd, I'd love to bring to the, to the SEL team that was assembled for the preschool. Um, and uh, at the high school, again, there's this commitment to doing uh, learning walks and teacher-to-teacher and -teacher feedback, which I've done a lot of. And, uh, and I think is really kind of the gold standard for professional growth and improvement in practice is uh, peer learning. It is such an isolating, as those of you who work in classrooms know, it is such an isolating uh, endeavor and isolated endeavor. And so much growth in practice has been shown to come from other practitioners coming in after having articulated what preferred practice really looks and sounds like and then get going into one another's classroom and, and getting in the habit of giving critical feedback, just like we're trying to encourage our students to be doing in their, in their learning environments as well. So um, yeah, I've led around that, around a, you know, a handful of frameworks around Calkins uh, literacy. Uh, that's how we got good at it, was by, by colleagues going into one another's classrooms and giving each other critical feedback. Um, so I feel like, you know, honestly, as I went through the strategic plan and the school improvement plans, it was 
really um, exciting to see such a again a, an alignment of priorities and also um, alignment to priorities that I've had uh, for a while and have had some success with. Can you talk to us about, um, through your career, what you might highlight as a challenge that you've had to face in your um, either administrative career or could be as a teacher, how you've grown from that, and then also what would be a highlight of your career thus far? Yeah. Wow. Um, each, each, each day something good happens with kids feels like the highlight, you know? Um, but, um, so, I, Unique challenge, actually, you know, any leadership transition is really challenging. Um, so I'll hang out at the latest, um, and uh, you know, it was um, Stratton is a really high achieving blue ribbon school and has done some really wonderful things up to the point that I became principal. There were uh, there wasn't necessarily a big uh, habit or routine of um, uh, sort of feedback or, or observation reports that were um, brought to people. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know <laughs> I learned from that leadership transition that um, best intentions are, are what they are, but, you know, if, if in a position of authority uh, they aren't received right or they you know they rankle or they send things sideways then they're no good so um, so I had nothing but the best intentions in starting that process of giving feedback both written and informal but it was really jarring for people and um, and they let me know that um, so uh, you know that was a challenge to kind of get on the other side of that like you know okay obviously I got to back up but then what are the levers to pull to get us in a position where we can and that's where we really came up with a, a peer feedback model. Um, and then, uh, boy, successes. Um, I think that one that, that comes to mind is uh, how we've integrated the substantially separate special education program that's, uh, that's housed at Stratton School. There's a a different hub for substantially separate special education in each elementary school in Arlington. And uh, at Stratton School, it's for um, students, uh, ASD students who need substantially separate programming. And uh, when I began, it was, you know, obviously, again, lots of people with lots of good intentions, but I could tell that we could do more by way of integration and um, by way of making this part of the, the, the fabric of the school um, and talk to the practitioners about that and their perceptions and if they felt the same way. So we spent a long time, like two years, developing ways in which um, uh, the program, while it was growing to roughly 200% of what it is when I started, um, by way of just pure numbers, uh, it is such a I mean, just the placement of the classrooms and the dynamics between faculty and students is just, it's, you know, it's great to see. And it's, and it's very different from, from what, it, what it was when we started. So um, yeah, that's something that I'm proud of, you know, helping to lead around. Do you think uh, the Hopkinton curriculum needs a change? Do you think there's room for making it better? Yeah, but I think that uh, that's the case for all school districts in the United States at this time. I think that we have a common charge to uh, create, and when we say curriculum, I'm always thinking curriculum and instruction because it, it, they, they, they're knotted together. And how, you know, what we do and how we do it, I think that every school in America faces a challenge about making a shift. And what's exciting about Hopkinton is that I imagine that that shift can really happen. And that shift isn't like a light years away from what's being currently done. That's what's why I'm optimistic. I can tell that people are really interested in coaching kids to become really good thinkers 
and really good people. Those are the coin of the realm of the 21st century, are people who are emotionally intelligent, who can talk to lots of different sorts of people, who can write well, um, putting that on the front burner and kind of letting our, you know, typical associations of, okay, I gotta cover this, I gotta cover that. That's the shift that I think all of us are facing. And so, you know, that, that we have a, um, a town here that really does have an achievement level and an understanding of what I just said that it can really happen and that, you know, because it's already happening, I'd love to be a part of what I see as kind of a wave beginning to, to roll. That, that's, that's how I feel about this, this place. And um, yeah, that sounds exciting because I don't think I'd have to start a wave. And so um, yeah, so I, I don't think that Hopkinson's unique in that way. You're very well put. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll ask my signature final question. So, if you were the successful candidate and you left the Stratton School, what would you hope they would remember about you? I would hope that they really felt like I walked the talk. Um, you know, I have been a part of of leadership teams. <laughs> I've been part of teams that have been very dictatorial about democratic decision making. <laughs> um, you know, who don't quite, you know, do with the grown-ups what they want to have happen with the kids. And I, and I hope, and I, because I keep it in my mind all the time, so I'm hoping that that's what they remember is that what I feel is really important for kids to develop is the way that I worked with the adults as well. Um, yeah, I hope that, that, that it wasn't just, uh, you know, principles and, and ideas for kids, and, but that I really honored the people that I worked with in getting there. What do you and your family like to do outside of work? Oh, well, um, we like to travel a lot, uh, as much as we can. We are, like most of us, we got bogged down. But I'm a, I taught French, I'm a French speaker, so we go to lots, lots of French speaking um, places, as many as we can. Um, but, you know, we're a pretty close family, even though they're two teenagers. Um, like uh, during the snow day today, we all went bowling. Um, until the 16-year-old peeled off with his girlfriend, which is fine. Um, it's a great young woman, so that's fine. Um, but uh, we read a lot. Um, we don't have cable, so that helps a lot. <laughs> um, we're pretty, um, Wendy and I are pretty strict on online time and phone time and stuff like that. So they could, both Ben and Peter can attest to that. Um, but that just gives us a lot of space to, you know, we have dinner together every night, you know, that's um, unnegotiable. And, um, you know, they're very busy teenagers, but uh, we have good adventures together. Um, we were, and it's nice now that they are older, we can reflect and, and remember some things. So we were remembering snow days past, uh, what we used to do, and uh, was it was a big, because we try, we drive a lot. We drive to Quebec, <coughs> stuff like that. So, um, we listen to a lot of stories and podcasts, and you know that's a common source of conversation among us. Or all this different. Uh, some of you know, my son was listening to a podcast as he was shoveling us out. So that's kind of how we go. Um, yeah, hope you can see a snapshot of us in that. like to make just one sort of kind of wrap-up statement yeah um, I think that I think I've said it but I just want to reiterate it one more time I feel like there's a pretty close alignment to 
to what it is that I'm about and what it is that Hopkinton's about um, and becoming. And so I think it, it feels like a really nice fit. You know, it would be disingenuous for me to say that I haven't thought about other districts or even interviewed, but it honestly, it, it feels like there's a, um, some kind of synthesis between what my leadership priorities are, who it seems like, uh, you all are, so um, that's why I'm here, and uh, and and I thought that all the cars were here for this public. <laughs> we did we too. too. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Where would we put them? Yeah. But you know, wow, what a thriving! Uh, so great to see the arts so thriving here too, and in fruitlessly looking for a parking spot going across the by the art center. So beautiful, and just the. Um, the uh, monthly, no, is it monthly, monthly magazine? Or annual, annual magazine from the art department um, at the high school. It's just, I, I flipped through that, it was unbelievable, the, the pieces that were created. And, and I love that, is it Vinny's in town that displays the artwork? Is it a pizza place that, that puts a, what is it? Is it Bill's? Is it Bill's? I don't know. Sure. 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 But yeah, it's, I, I, boy, I feel like when we're talking about like what does great teaching and learning look like, I think art teachers, visual and performing art teachers have a notion of what the classroom of the 21st century looks and sounds like. You know, it, it's kids charged with really authentic things, lots of iterations and failures. I notice in the, the uh, strategic plan a, an emphasis on, on helping students become okay with failure. Um, trying again, getting peer feedback, um, the, the teacher on the side, you know, jumping in when, when necessary, it's just um, great stuff. So it was, it, that was really fun to walk into, actually hearing, hearing kids sing. But I'll let you all go, because I, I know that the longer I talk, the less <laughs> you're in your car getting out of here. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's good talking to you.